Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers, and in this week's training, we're going to be going over the Dynamic General Journal, where users have the ability to enter specific transactions with just a few keystrokes and automatically select specific accounts for balances as well based on dates. It's going to be an amazing training, so let's get started. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you so much for joining me today. I really can't wait to get to this. So many of you have asked me for this type of training, a dynamic general journal account register, or the ability. You now, Excel is a perfect tool for this. In fact, we're going to put our own spin on it. We want to make it dynamic. So it's as opposed to having multiple registers, we just want to have one single register that displays it based on whatever specific types of expense income or chart of accounts or whatever type of transactions you have we want them all displayed and we want to do that based on specific dates so if we choose specific dates we want it to filter based on those dates so it's going to be a great training in fact we've also got a general journal which is going to list all of the transactions all of the transactions here and you can scroll up and down based on the dates that you have selected so changing those dates will automatically increase or decrease those transactions based on those dates so we've We've got a lot on that issue we have also got the ability to enter transactions so when we enter a brand new transaction and we select a date for example we can select a debit account so for example if we want to do uh, cash on hand in fact if we've paid for something we can do that or if we've got received money from a specific person we can do that simply by entering the amount and then selecting the other account so if, if a customer has paid us uh, from accounts receivable or from an invoice we could just do invoice and then uh, we can uh, go ahead and credit that and that is how it's going to work and if your user tries to enter an incorrect balance we're going to get a warning saying hey you cannot do that it's got to be balanced out and so we're going to go over all the rules on that and once it's entered you're going to get a green confirmation and then it's going to be entered and that is going to be available both in the uh, cash on hand in the accounts receivable accounts as well as the general journal so if we were to look in the accounts receivable and we're going to go ahead and see that transaction right here automatically so that's going to be great and as well as the cash on hand as well so that's going to go up automatically based on dates here based on the last one seconds so there's a lot to show you in this training we have had it in fact we are going to be able to have all of our transactions located here in a list of transactions. So this is a great way to have your general journal and it's automatically dynamic based on the account. We can also have a little refresh here in case we make changes. So that's great. Now, when you have all of this data, one of the best ways to display that data in types of reports, graphs or charts is with our reports and graphs masterclass and that would be the excel advanced dashboard reports and masterclass so that's here if you have not seen that yet get a chance so when you combine this account register that we're going to be good the general ledger combining it with this masterclass you've created an amazing application that you can sell in the marketplace in fact this masterclass here this application i'm showing you is a single click graph so you have lots and lots of financial tools and you can create additional reports as well you also have the ability to toggle columns if you haven't seen this and you also have the ability to add custom reports so if we were going to select specific columns and we we're going to select specific dates we could then create a custom report based on that date range based on that and enter report name and then you have an amazing custom report that is automatically geared for those specific columns for those specific date ranges so it's going to be a really great training once you have this is a 15 hour masterclass so if you haven't seen that yet do check it out we have lots and lots of tools available for you in this as long as the drop down list excel pdf picture which we can save as we have the ability to email as excel pdf or picture so tons of tools in this do check it out if you haven't done so yet all right let's get to the training i'll include the links to this masterclass down below so check it out in the description if you want it i've got a promotion going on right now so go ahead and check that out all right back to the dynamic general journal we go so this is an amazing application that's going to let you expand in fact this is going to be part one of perhaps two or three parts so because 
because there's a lot to get to here. We've got a lot to show you, a lot of training. We've got conditional formatting, a lot of it going on here. We also have a chart of accounts, and this is the master chart of accounts where you can create your own accounts based on your own account type. We've got uh, also our account types. We're gonna focus on that income. Our income is a money coming in, cost of a good sold. Now, cost of goods sold, otherwise known as C O G S, is uh, specific expenses that have to do or tied to specific jobs or materials or labor that go in to specific jobs, whereas expenses are expenses uh, unrelated to specific jobs. And I'll show you how that works in a profit and loss. Uh, coming on, they are separated. We have bank or asset type of account, checking account, cash account. Those would all be bank or asset types. Credit card or liability accounts, money that you owe in a credit card or liability. We also have an equity account, owner's equity, when owner puts money into a specific business, uh, that becomes an owner's equity account. So we've got those six specific types. Now, keep in mind, income, cost of goods sold, and expenses, they don't have balances. Those are not balance type accounts, but we do have total income, total cost of goods sold. Now, I am not an accountant, so I do have some understanding of accounting. So please, if you are an accountant and you do see something that needs to be modified, changed, or updated, I would very much appreciate your feedback on this. So feel free to email Randy at excelforfreelancers.com and email me with some updates. And I'll go ahead and put those updates. This is going to be a multi-part application, two or three parts. So I'm happy to make those updates just in case, in case I got some rules wrong, which is certainly possible. We also have transaction types, and you can put whatever transaction types here. Now, transaction types are a great way to set what type of specific transaction type uh, you have. So we can do bill, payment, uh, credit card, or whatever whatever type of uh count we want and then of course if we make any changes just click the check mark and it's automatically changed and that green uh, c color will highlight and let us know that that's been done so we've got that back to the chart of accounts so you can create your own I, you have the ability to put in a description and a balance here i guess i can put it a balance i just haven't done that yet but i wanted a space for it so we can quickly see what the balances are on it now of course uh, expense, income, uh, and cost of goods wouldn't have balances, but we could put in a total, I guess, total expenses, but we don't really have a date range on here. So at least for the bank accounts, uh, for our um, asset liability and equity, those would all have balances. We also have the vendors and names. Well, these are just names tied to a specific transaction. So that's uh, what's something. And of course, I've got some rules here to remind me and to help you see how these uh, specific balances are calculated and how they go about it. So I'll keep that. We'll go over this in just a little bit. Those are just a little reminder here for me and for you so that we can see how those accounts are affected when they're totaled. All right, let's get to it. We've got a lot. So basically what what we're going to do is we want to display the specific accounts. It is basically a filter based on whatever we've selected here or based on the transaction dates that we've selected here. And we have a pop-up calendar. You may have seen this. This is a pop-up calendar that I built a few years ago. In fact, I do have that available specifically uh, in uh, one of our training videos, but I'll include it here as well. And that's a pop-up calendar that you can actually use in any application. Is it a shape-based pop-up calendar? So that gives us a lot of the ability to have a cool look and feel so we can change the color of this calendar quite easily just by selecting a color something I built uh, it is a, it is a great little calendar tool I guess I should add a year here but we do have the ability to go previous month and next month here so uh, it's a great way and once the count once the colors change it will remain that way so all right so we also have the calendar popping up here as well on the date frame so i'll show you exactly how we do that in case we want to make an update we just click the update and then it's automatically updated all right let's get to it so now we've got also an ending balance here we'll go over that and uh so that's pretty much it so when you select all accounts that is actually the general journal there's no balance associated with it because we're focused on every single account here and then it's a great way we can enter transactions in a general journal so we can enter new transactions here or we can go to specific accounts and enter uh, new transactions as well so we've got a lot of a lot of ability a lot of flexibility with this type of uh, general journal and I, and I see as we built it out we're we're going to add a lot in in fact i'm going to add in split transactions a split transaction is something is if if you charge a, a specific 
if you charge something specific on your credit card and you have multiple different expense accounts that you want to use you want to break that down maybe you charge a hundred dollars on your credit card but you want to break it down into multiple types of expenses for multiple accounts that would be a split transaction. So I'd like to add that probably in next week so that we have the ability. So for example, if you went out and uh, you uh, had a charge on your credit card for $50, maybe 45 of it is for meal and $5 is for taxes. So you might want to split that up. At, and so we do have the ability to do that. Maybe not all of it would be meal, meals and entertainment. All right, so we've got that covered. And then of course we have our list of transactions. This is actually our source data. This is the database in which all of our transactions are originated from. So uh, this is where they go. And the reason that we don't just add the transaction is here because when we add them in our general journal, when we add them in specific accounts, it gives us the ability to check to make sure that there's no issues. For example, if we're missing a date, that would be a problem. So we don't want to add in we want to make sure that we add in a specific date here and we also don't want to miss any account so it gives us the ability if we try to save a transaction it's going to tell us hey we need both to and from accounts you know in this case a debit or credit account so we would need to put those in as well and uh, we would also want to have the ability to uh, add in specific names and of course we need the, the debit and the credit account so that's really really important as far as uh, the name the matching name so if we purchase something in fact uh, if we purchase specific clothing here in fact this will be let's say we have a transaction where we're going we've purchased some clothes from some account and so we would just put purchase clothing and let's say if we paid cash for it we would just select our cash on account here cash on hand here and we just put our notes in here purchased clothing and then uh, we would go into the debit amount which is actually uh, what we're using the amount let's say it was ten dollars and then we want to make sure if we enter an incorrect amount here it's going to tell us hey those need to balance out we need to make sure that the debits and credits in accounting are always the same so having them in a register like this will allow us to do just that and we can even add a specific uh, type of transaction here into type and then click enter and it's going to enter that automatically so when we go back into our transactions we're going to see that that purchase was right here purchase clothing although you generally don't purchase from acme building but you get the point so we have the ability to do that right here so it adds it all up here and I th i'll probably add a balance uh, here maybe i'll add some type of a balance here for that but that would be tied to the specific account so we'll keep that in mind this is just a temporary column i think we're going to be adding something in a little bit later on so you'll see that so we see we how we have specific uh, accounts and we have conditions to make sure that nothing is missing and of course if we do want to make a change to that we can just quickly make a change and then save those changes and that quick green confirmation lets us know that that was changed so when we look back in we see that that date has automatically been changed here into both the debit and this is a dual accounting so there's two transactions that are in one for the credit one for the debit account so we can see that uh, has done there and we have our debit account here and our credit account here and everything else has been duplicated so we have that except for the amounts and that helps us bring our balance and we may use this row uh, in the future to help us dictate what row is on when we bring the data back so far we're okay all right so when we have specific accounts I also want to list the ending balance of that so I want to know let's go ahead and find cash and account so I know that our ending balance is 290 for a cash account I want that here so that's the ending balance it's always nice to see up there and also we have the ability to scroll up and scroll down and have that header fixed all right so let's get into the nuts and bolts of this and see exactly how we did that and we'll focus first on the on sheet the conditional formatting and then we'll go ahead and move over to the VBA it's gonna be a great training so we also have the formulas and what we did first of all we just froze that so I've got uh, row 8 frozen here and to do that all I have did was select row 8 and into the view menu we just click the freeze pane and then we'll freeze the rows if we unfreeze it and then you'll see it's scrollable but then holding uh, clicking on the 
row eight and then into the view and then freeze panes is going to freeze that so that we can scroll up and down this nice this gives you the ability to always be able to see the headers which i really like especially for the accounts and we may do an automatic scroll to the bottom so we may do like once you get uh, your you have a lot of transactions you may not want to continue scrolling down so what we can do is we can always auto scroll to the last a row with a value so that might be helpful so you can quickly enter transactions I also may do automated so if the display accounts cash on hand I may automatically have that selected here so let me know if that's something you want to see so we may automatically do that as well and if you just if you enter transaction but you click refresh you don't save that transaction I just made it so that it's cleared out so you actually have to click save or click this checkbox so that you can save the transaction so that's handy it also had the ability to void I would like to void those transactions so I'm gonna have that ability hopefully coming up all right moving on so let's go over how we did that now the first thing I want to do is uh, when I select a row I want to highlight that row in orange and I want to use an, a two-tiered color a light orange or a little bit darker orange to do that and so the first thing is I want to know what row the owners the uh, user has selected so over in columns a and b i've got a few additional details and you'll see that the selected row in b2 automatically changes so that when we select a row in fact no matter what row we select it's going to be the even row so for example if the user selects row 13 automatically 12 is going to be placed here if the user selects 11 automatically 10 is going to be placed here in fact I need to add this you see this one didn't so it's got to start at column D so let's let's make that change and we'll also show you how we did that but not quite not in the second here not in the second so we need to add that in and uh, but it does work in the first row so we'll, we'll do that all right so moving on what I want to do is I want to show you exactly how we got the even row here in B2 so let's go into the VBA if you uh, can go into the developers tab here and click on visual basic you can also use the shortcut key alt F11 if you don't have the developers tab available you can go into the file options and into the customize ribbon and just make sure developer is selected here that'll get you the developers ribbon so let's go ahead and we get into the VBA and now we've got some macros call on the general journal this is the on sheet macros and what we were focused on right now is selection change selection change now the first part of this has to do with our calendar in case it winds up missing it'll replace itself so we're not going to focus on that right now and uh, we're going to go down here and we're going to see if the target there's a selection we're going to say if count large and this helps us avoid bugs when a large number of cells is selected you'll see sometimes if you're working with Excel with VBA and the user selects a large number of cells automatically it's going to create a bug here but uh, because we have count large is greater than one then exit sub it doesn't create a bug here so in fact let me just uh, change the color you'll see there's numbers that are tied here I want to change those colors to black so you can see that and I'll go ahead and show you what those are soon but that's a little bit of a reminder okay going back in so we understand why we use count large now if not intersect the target G4 H4 or D8 through D9999 what is that that is for our calendar that's going to show our calendar so we have these two cells G4 and H4 or D8 through D999 why is that let's take a look at that into our thing we have here we want our calendar to appear under G4 when it happens to that we also want it under H4 we also want it if we select any specific in but not any specific one not not any specific in D not not uh, odd rows only even rows right only even rows so we, how do we do that let's take a look so that would be D8 D10 D12 and so on and so forth so only the even row so let's see how we did that so we can use this specific in fact this is the reason why it's not coming up uh, why our intersect here is nothing I'll show you that in a second if the target row mod 2 equals 1 then exit the sub what is this it means if the user has selected an odd row if it was here if we did this it would be an even row if we do this one it will be an odd row so that's basically saying the mod of 2 if it's 1 
right? That means like the remainder of the remainder, that means it's an odd row the user has selected then ed that we don't want to show the calendar sheet this we're not going to go over too much this checks for the make sure there's a pop-up calendar sheet and this shows the calendar and this else checks for sheet so basically this has the ability to check for that calendar in fact let me add this up here i'm going to add this I'm going to take this, I'm going to drag it right up here. And why do we do that? Well, what I want to do is I want to sh highlight the row. I want to highlight the row, which does that here into B2. But I wanted to do it before we exit the sub on an odd row. Why is that? So now when we select, now when we select a specific, now you see it highlights. Remember, we'd selected an odd row and it wasn't working, but now it is because I just moved it up. I moved it up because there's no exit sub right now. So that works just fine. I just wanted to show you that. Remember, we had a little bit of an issue when we didn't select. All right, so now, so when we make a selection, B2 is changed to the row. So let's take a look at that. When we make a selection from anywhere from D8 through I999, that is our entire table, it's nothing, then do something. What do we want to do? If, again, here we go, the target mod, mod equals zero this means it's an even row if the user has selected an even row 8 10 12 14 16 right then do something then b2 value equals the target row else b2 value equals the target row minus one why is that minus so that means if it's an even row if it's an even row then put that row in b2 but why why but if not if it's an odd row then take the whatever row they've selected subtract one because i only want i want to show the beginning in other words if they select this transaction i want to make sure that 12 is here not 13 because this is our starting because our transactions take up two specific rows so i need to cover both of them i always want to know what the first row of that transaction is right there's two rows i want to know when the user selects 17 i want to know the first row is 16 so i always want to place it that's going to help us for a lot of reasons for our conditional formatting and for a different and when we enter transactions too we want to know the starting row so we want to be specific about that because this particular transaction takes up two different rows so that's very very important all right moving on so now we know what row now we know what row we know why it shows row 16 when we select 17 we know why it shows 16 so we did that with that but how do we get the color to show up well let's go into the conditional formatting and show just how we got that orange color just highlight any cells under the home and conditional formatting and manage those rules we've got several rules here we're going to go over the orange one right now these two our orange and all we need to do is base it on the row in B2 so when we edit that rule we'll see two conditions two we're gonna use two conditions and the row this is the lighter orange the row of B2 equals the row so in this case it would be 8 right 8 is the one highlighted in this light orange so that means B2 is 8 and we need to make sure the D8 now you notice the missing dollar sign in front of 8 that means it's going to be for any row in the table and the only thing you want to make sure of is that this 8 is also for this particular type of coloring this 8 for every row we want to make sure that are also that applies to starts on row 8 so there's two conditions that means that I don't want when we when we select a cell we select so with nothing here I don't want it to be highlighted unless we actually put in a data and then I wanted to show them what the user is on so I just didn't want to show this when we don't select anything we could probably add it so that that we had a row that we if we add it in maybe one below we can add it in but basically when the user selects something else I don't want it showing up there's no data here only when there's specific data all right so we've got that covered and so that's how we do the orange let's go back into conditional formatting manage rules and take a look so we know that now what about the darker orange now when we edit that rule we'll see just a little bit different that's going to be b2 remember that's our even row plus one so that's going to be one row below and of course d8 again we don't want it to show on rows with blank values so there's two conditions b2 plus one in this case it's 20 plus one which is 21 and we have the ability that's going to give us our darker orange color and all we're doing is formatting that 
could be dark orange. And of course, we're going to apply that to starting at 9 and 12. 9 here, we want this to show 9, which is the first row below. And of course, this one starts at 8. So we have different rows because we don't want it to start. So this one starts at 8, this one starts at 9, and it goes all the way to 338. That's just the number I picked. You'll probably want more to add more onto that because you're going to be, when you use this, you're going to be using thousands of rows. All right, so we've got that covered. So now we know how to do that. Now let's move on to our conditional formatting. Now when I enter a transaction, did you see that it went green? I'm going to use conditional formatting. If we enter a transaction, let's say we're going to enter another cash on hand, and uh, we also want to enter... Uh, so again, we'll just put anything in here and uh, we can do uh, other income exactly and we can scroll down our list called other income and we also have the ability to add in numbers here. I left a space on uh, here on chart accounts to add in account numbers. We do have the, I just have an added min for easy, but account numbers just because your account numbers will be, uh, in fact, there's no data validation on this. Let's just clear that data validation while we're at it. So these, this is where you can add in account numbers, but let's go ahead and clear that validated data validation and we'll clear that clear from the selected cells. Okay, so you can enter an account number here. I've left a space for that. All right, continuing on. So we have test notes here and then we'll just enter the credit of 100 and you'll notice that this automatically goes to green very quickly and you'll see that means that the transaction has been entered. So that gives you a nice visual to know that the transaction is entered, a confirmation, so to speak. And so how do we do that? Well, the first thing we use conditional formatting. And I want to know what row it was just entered. We do that through VBA. So we've also done that through here under saved row, B5. B5 is our saved row. So soon as this becomes 20 right as soon as that becomes 20 it turns green so I have that turning green and then I have it turning off so I use a delay so basically all I do is enter through VBA I enter 20 and then I clear 20 like that and I do it pretty quickly and you can delay it as long as you want you can put a delay on it we do that through VBA and we'll show you how we do that in VBA shortly but let's show you how we do the conditional formatting so I'll put in 20 here and all we're doing is pretty much the same when we go into home in conditional formatting and manage the rules. Oh, I have to highlight these specific cells. And then we'll go into manage rules and we'll see that all we did here, it's just a very simple row of B5 plus one. That would be for the lower cell, the lower row. And for the top row, we just have B5. So that's how we call it those two rows just temporarily while the transaction saved so our save row when we go through the vba you'll see that but our save row quickly gets added to b5 and then it gets removed so again gets quickly added and removed and that's how we create that green confirmation when an account is entered because i like a visual knowing that we could put a pop-up message but that, then the user has to click okay every time and that's kind of annoying we could put a um, we could put easily put a fade out message, which you've seen, but I wanted to try something a little bit different here, something quick, because when you just add a lot of transactions, I think a fade out message is not necessary. So all they need is just a very quick confirmation that the transaction has been entered and uh, even save. So if we make a change to that, any type we change, we click save and then we get that green confirmation that goes out. We could actually extend that for a little bit, but you get the idea. Okay, so we've got the ability to save and when we refresh that, we'll see that it's based on dates. Now it's based on dates. So we just added a date in here and it automatically gets resorted based on dates. Now you can change that if you want. You could reverse the order or do whatever you like if you want your current dates up at the top. But I've just done that right now. All right. So continuing on, we have shown you both the orange and the green conditional formatting. And now what I want to do is when I enter a new transaction, I want the rows to keep going down. So when I quickly enter a new date, you see how the rows skipped? And if we delete that, automatically the row is going to and that's used we use conditional formatting for that it's just uh so that as we enter transactions the rows go down so that the user sees they have the availability of the next row and the next row and the next row and that's a nice little trick it keeps things nice and clean and allows users to enter transactions without looking at a big blank list it kind of keeps it nice and simple so how did we do that well i used a, a several conditional formatting rules and we'll go over those rules right now 
we highlight the table going into the home conditional formatting manage the rules we'll see that we have three specific rules based on the blue the blue and let's take a look at this one here edit the rule now this one applies to d12 through 3338 and what i want is this rule let's take a look at this so basically in this rule we have it's starting out where our table starts out d8 does not equal empty d9 does not equal empty. if one of those two do not equal empty and and other conditions d10 d11 and moderate i know it's a little bit confusing but let's walk through that step by step okay so let's start out here if d8 actually we'll start at the lower row it's a little bit we're saying if there's two d that are empty in a row empty in a row then make sure this is blue but as soon as a user fills out either one here or something here if if this one or this one remember we start out at eight we start out at eight or above actually but basically it's used for any specific row so we're saying if some if the first option or the second option has a value then don't color the rows below but color the ones below so we want to color those so that means we can have this one or this one has a value but this one is empty this one is empty then color it blue so let's go back into that and see exactly how we did that manage rules so again we look here and we go into this edit or the or the one above or the one below if those have a value if there's a not empty not empty and d10 and d11 are blank that means the one below so we have we get we have one here one here those can have values these two are blank if the next two are automatically blank i just messed that up if the next two are blank then color it blue let's take a look at that format and also on odd rows too so we have one for odd one for even what are we going to format it's the same blue background when we look on the border we want the i want the automated border to whatever the automated border is here at the top but cleared out everywhere else so that means i want that thick blue line that thick blue line is our actual border it is our actual border so if we were to strip out all the conditional formatting you would see every row has that thick blue border but i only want it to show up on the last row i only want that thick blue border to show up in the last row so again let's going back into this rule and so we only want that to show on even rows right even rows i don't want it to show up on an odd row odd row would be 25 i want it to show up on 26 or 28 or 30 right we don't want it to show up on 25 right because we want to use that dotted line here so we only want to show up 26 27 so if we were to remove that so let's let's remove let's remove these two then we want to show up on 24 you so see so it's we want to make sure that that thick blue line only shows up on even rows that's why we use again the mod we've used that both in uh, the uh, code today and we've used it in the conditional formatting so continuing on so we have that that's why we want that thick blue border let's take a look at the other blue edit the rule and this one here is if there is four in column d if there's four that are blank in a row color not only do we color it blue but we do more so let's say there's four in a row eight nine ten eleven remember it starts out but these could mean any four because there's no dollar sign there's no absolute before the number that means it's for every single row in our table okay so if we format this let's say we see no borders in this format no borders that means if there's no data in D, I don't want any borders to show up, and I want this fill blue. So we use that rule for all of the data down here. And let's take a look at this. This is also very similar, very similar, but this particular one is going to be on the odd rows, the odd rows. Remember, this one, B8, here we go. This rule this is the last rule. D8 does not possibly does not have value or d9 but i also want to show this for the odd row so we had one for the even and one for the odd but for the odd format and let's look in the border here there's no borders no borders 
No borders in the odd rows of that. So that basically gives us the ability to not show any borders down here. And as soon as a user enters a specific data in one of them, automatically the rows show up below. So that's how you do it. So that's how we do it. I know it's a, it went a little bit fast, but we got a lot to cover today. So I don't want to go spend too long in the condition formatting. Of course, I will make this available. Just go ahead and uh, check out the links below and I'll make sure this is available. And of course, we do appreciate your support. So these uh, classes, the master class, as well as the ultimate Excel resource guide, I'll include the link down there below. If you want to pick those up, that helps us keep this training free. So I really appreciate that. All right, moving on when we let's go ahead and take a look at any others that we might want to see in the conditional formatting before we move on to some code we will see that we now have a row. We have another one. What is this? Let's take a look at this row. If D8 does not equal empty and the mod row equals one, that means odd rows, odd rows. I want to put a solid blue line at the bottom. Odd rows, what is that? That is for this here. You see this here on 19, that's got a solid blue. 21's got a solid blue. 23's got a solid blue. Why do we put a solid blue on the odd row? This has a value or this or this has a value here, then we want a solid blue line here. So even if we enter this, even if we enter this here, when we enter the date, all we get a nice solid blue on the odd row on rows 23, 21, 19. So otherwise it's a dotted line. So that helps us with conditional formatting. So we go back in here, conditional formatting, manage rules, take a look once again. So the conditions are D8, we do not have a blank. We could put an or D8, but that's okay because there's always going to be a date. So that means the first row must have a date and it must be an odd row. So in those cases, put a solid blue line. That's how we get the alternating solid blue line, not for every row. If we were to change, if we were to remove this, it would show up for every single row. So we don't want that. I only want that on the odd rows. Okay. All right. So we've covered that. Let's take a look at this rule. Now in this particular case, we have D8, D9, D10, D11, D12. In this case, when all those conditions, what is this? In this case, we have just the upper row here, the upper row, and that helps us to give us that thick border at the bottom when all those conditions are present. So I wanted to show you that as well. That helps us with the formatting. So these are the rules. We just went over all the rules. We went over the green, we went over the thick border, we went over the orange, and we went over the blue, the three blue that help us determine and show just those rows with values and the newest row. So it gives the user a guidance as to what to do next. So we have that guidance. So once it's deleted, they always have at least one available row at the bottom where they can enter transactions. That is the point of the conditional formatting. All right, so we've covered conditional formatting. Let's go ahead and get back into the VBA on the selection change to see what else we are doing here. All right, continuing on, we went over selection change. And also, I want the save button on some things. I want to show the save button, but I, in fact, I want to turn it off when the user has selected something else. So if the user selects D8 through D99, that's okay. We're going to keep that save button. In fact, we don't need this at all. That was, uh, and then what they want to do is set, I want to set the new transaction to false if they've selected some transaction. So let's look at that. We we have two differentials here in the B6. We're going to show whether it's a new transaction or not. These are existing transactions. So I want to make sure that B6 is false. But when they select a new transaction, I want to show that we actually have a new transaction once we enter it. We can use that by B6. So B6 is going to tell us if it's a new transaction or not. But I want to make sure that we know it's not a new transaction when we select. So B6 tells us it's not a new transaction. Also, the transaction number is always going to be here and it's going to be hidden but this is our transaction number so if we look here we also have a transaction number a list of transaction that transaction number is actually carried over to the c column so we can track so we know that any transaction 
that we user is entering that doesn't have a value here is going to be new. So that's we need to know whether it's new or not. Why do we need to know it's new or not? Because we need to know whether we're going to add that new transaction down here or whether we're going to update it here. So for example, if we select a specific transaction, let's look into uh, let's say transaction number nine, we see said Silva to Fred and we want to add a last name to that Fredders. And before we add it in, we have before we add it in, we'll see here on transaction number nine, if we click here, we'll see that it's sold to Fred, the memo here in both rows. But if we want to change that, all we need to do is click this updated green checkbox. And now when we go back into this, now we say Fred Fredders, it's been changed automatically. So we need to know that. So we need to know what transaction number is so that we can locate it. We also have the ability to locate the row. We know the transaction rows here. How do we know that row? Well, what I've done is created some named ranges for the list of transactions that is going to help us moving forward so how do we do that under the formulas name manager let's take a look at some of the named ranges and they start with all transactions so when we look here transactions let's bring this here and open the refer to that we can see that they're all offset formulas meaning those named ranges are dynamic so as our table grows, so does this name. Let's take a look at the transaction number. We're going to edit that and see how the transaction number is the name we've been given. They all start with trans, the underscore, and then whatever label we've chosen. And this is going to be offset D4. D4 is the header row. Why did I include D4 in the header row? That is because I do not want an error to come up when all of the data is cleared. When you get this file, you may want to clear all of your data. I'm including the header row so that this offset transaction doesn't have an error. There's always going to be data. But I've set it one row off, one row below, so this way it doesn't include it. So when we tab into this, we will see that it actually starts at one row below, below the four. Also, we're going to count all of the values in here. We're going to count using count A. And we're going to count also from the header row. And we're going to count all the way to 987, except we're going to minus 1. Because we're starting at the header row, we don't want to include the header row. We don't want to include the header row in the counting, but we do want to include the header row in case there's no data so that there's no issue. So we subtract 1, and that gives us an accurate named range a dynamic name range so that as we add values this changes and we've done the same thing for each of them we've got transaction type here oh sorry we've got transaction date here we have transaction debit account here we've got transaction credit account here so we can see the credit so that count we've also got debit amount and credit amount so the Transaction credit amount is here. That's going to help us for totals. We've also got transaction debit here. That's going to help us for totals. So those are all dynamic. They're all based on specific data in this table. And that's going to help us moving forward. So next up, I want to know when the user selects it, I want to know if we have a specific transaction row. So how do we know that? We know the selected row is going to be 18, right? So we need the selected transaction number. We're going to index. What are we indexing? We're going to index the selected row, 18, and we're going to use C. We're going to index C1 through C99. That's going to index all of these numbers here and tell us what Row, what is in row B2? So, for example, we're going to index everything here, and I want to know what's in row 18 on that index. Eight, eight is used. Eight is going to be our result. So, if we're indexing the entire C row, right? And remember, and when we index, there's a few. We need the first part is the array, the second part is the row number, and the third is the column number. So, with the column number is just one because we're indexing. We're not indexing more than one column. We need to know the row to get the value, but we know the rows in B2. I showed you how that is. So that's going to tell us our selected transaction number. So as we select it, our transaction number is going to change unless we have a new transaction. Then, of course, our transaction row is not going to be there because it's a new transaction. So once we have our tra selected transaction number, we can know our transaction row. That is our row in the 
database, which is 17. So for example, so select the transaction number 13. Our database row, that means the row in the transaction is 17. So when we look at 17, we will see that our first row of this transaction is located right here into list of transactions, 17. So that gives us our number. So we, because we need to know when we make an update, I need to know what row we're going to be updating. So that's very important. So I need to know that through our VBA code. So we need to know the row of the original transaction, not just the number, but the row as well. So we've got that there. So that also tells us where to make those updates. All right, continuing on with our code. If the user selects a change, I don't want the green checkbox to show up because they haven't made any changes. But what if they make what if they make a change? What if they change this to 44? When they make a change, I want them to be able to save those changes. And they can quickly do it by selecting the green checkbox. Now this green checkbox, once we make a quick change, it's going to show up. Let's take a look at that. Right click on this box, all it is is a shape with a square and then an icon above it. I've given that a name called Save Button. And we're going to tell that we want it to appear in column J. want that Save Button to appear in column J of whatever row that we have selected. And of course, if we select outside the cell, if we select outside, I want to remove it. Outside the table, I want to remove it. So let's look into the VBA code and see how we did that. Here is Selection Change. If we select outside, than else. In other words, if we select inside D8, we're going to do these things. Else, else means outside that range, then hide that button. Outside the range, hide the button. Inside this range, don't hide it. Outside the range, hide it. So again, let me show that to you again. In if it's if it's if it's already changed, right? And and the user selects outside, I want to hide the button. Because I only want them focused on this particular transaction when they're making changes. So that's how we do that. All right, so how do we get that button to appear? When a user makes a change to any existing, any transaction actually, I want it to appear. So all we need to do is double click on anything and exit out or make a change and it's going to appear. So how do we do that? We do that on worksheet change and that will be up here. Worksheet change here. So if a user makes a change to anything in DA99 and B1 is false, why is B1 false? Well, there's also there's two types of changes. There's the type of change when a user double clicks and makes a specific change or changes an account or changes a, a date or changes a transaction type. That's one type of change. And there's another change where we actually select on a specific account and have it reload automatically. So that type of change is dictated by one cell. So I don't want the green to show up when that type of change is made. Two types of change. So how do we differentiate between those two types of change? Well, I use this load journal, right? And I'm going to put this in B1 as false. So when we run the code to refresh this, this goes to true and then it goes back to false. So if this is true, that green checkbox is not going to show up. It's only going to show up when this is false. Now, when we run through that code, I'm going to show you how this becomes true and then it becomes false. It's too fast. I think it's too fast to see it now. You can't see it. Oh, you can see it very quickly. You can see it very quickly change from true to false. So when it's true, those types of changes don't aren't going to cause that checkbox to show up in a row here. Only when the user makes an actual change. So that's why we need to make sure before we show that green checkbox that B1 is false. If it is, then continue. If the current row is an even row, then B2, B2 we're going to make sure that the target row in B2, the row that they've changed. So again, we want that row in B2. I want the even row. So that if they've if they've made a change to an even row, this will be zero. Then B2 equals that. But if they've made a change to an odd row, 17, 19, 21, then B2 is going to be that row minus one because I always want the even row to show up in B2. I always want so if they make a change to B15, right? I want to make sure that 14 is showing up here in B2. So that's, we want that. That's the, we, that's the first thing we want. The next is we're going to run a macro called show save button. That's the macro that gets that green button to show up. Let's take a look at that and view that mac through definition. We're going to see this small macro here called show save button. Of course, we're focused on sheet one. 
sheet one that's really important because we're doing everything was on sheet one and sheet one of course is our general journal so we're going to dimension the selected row as long that's a long and then b2 if b2 is value remember b2 is very important so if for some reason it's empty it should not be but if it's empty we're going to exit the sub just to double check the selected row here this long is going to be b2 value and now with the shapes save button with that button right with that little icon shape that's remember this is the name i've given it say we're going to do four different things or five different things the first thing i want to do is i want to place it to the left of j j give it left column j and whatever selected row i also want to put it on the top of j in the selected top row and then i want to what i want to do is move it a little bit to the right minus three would be left okay so i want to move it a little bit to the right and i want to move it a little bit down minus two would be moving it up right and so i want to move it a little bit and then i want to make it visible so we're going to do those five things left this is these four lines position it this line actually makes it visible so let's take a look at that and we'll zoom in just a little bit so we can see so if the user makes a change to this it's going to show up and of course it's not going to allow us it's going to say they're not equal which is exactly what we want and let's zoom in here and take a look at this you'll see how it's a little bit down a little bit to the left now if we don't use those increments it's going to put it right like this right on top and right on the left i don't really want it there i want it right in the middle i wanted to put i want to put it about down three spaces and to the right three spaces so that's what i want to move it down to the right and that's how we do that so that when we change this and we actually make it accurate and then we want to save those changes we just click the green and then those changes are automatically saved all right so now you see how we get it to position and why when we actually make a change our green checkbox appears so we've run through that macro now let's go ahead and take a look we have low transactions and we have transactions saved let's go into the transaction saved so we just did that we made a change and how do we save that transaction now remember the cool thing here is we can use this green to save existing or to for new for new transactions if we have a new specific transaction let's say we enter a new uh, cash on hand account and we can use any actually and we put in a name here we can use this green one on new as well so the only thing difference is the row we either going to take the row and uh let's see 125 and the credit of 125 and uh, we can give it a transaction type any type and we give it another account here so we can do let's just say owner's equity or test income or anything like that and uh test notes and so on this particular there is no row so we want to use the same macro if we right click actually if we right click inside inside of this shape we click assign macro sorry i right click assign macro you can't see that it's just down below right click assign macro and i see that the macro that's been assigned is called transaction save transaction save so we use that regardless of the new or use but we just have to differentiate in the code so when we click save it says both to and from accounts are required so let's go ahead and make sure that that happens there we go okay so we've entered the transaction and now we can move on so you'll see that now we have the brand new transaction right here oh sorry right we here here they're automatically sorted by date here in the transaction which is really really helpful we can sort by transaction number as well so there's a few ways we can do that all right so into the macro and let's just see how we do that how do we save based on an existing or new transaction so back into the vba we have this macro called save transaction and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to dimension a few variables here the last transaction row is long the selected row as long i need to know what row the transaction row i need to know where in the database the transaction and the transaction number so we're going to need all those and we're going to focus primarily on sheet one so if with sheet one for the beginning the selected rows in b2 we did go over that remember we did go over that a lot b2 is our selected row and i also need to check for three things i need to check for a balancing transaction that means the credits and the debits must equal each other that's important we need to check for the proper accounts and we need to check for a date all those things are required notes are not required and the transaction type is not required but these things are so the first thing we want to do is we want to be able to make sure that our account so that would mean 
this amount equals this amount or this amount equals this amount, right? So our debits and credits or credits and debits. They hand counting these have to be equal. They cannot, we cannot make a change to an existing and have it not equal. If these two are not equal, and then you try to save it, we need a confirmation that says, hey, please make sure your entry is in balance. Debits must equal credits. Debits must equal credits. So we have to make change to both. That is a dual counting system. We have to make sure they're the same in order to enter it. So now when they're entered, it does save it. And that is what I like about having a separate entry to the separate as opposed to just entering. It's so easy to make mistakes if you just enter them. But when we have a separate entry, we can have those mistakes checked for. So that's the first thing we want to check for is to make sure that the balancing transactions. So we know our selected row. So if G and the selected row, let's move this down here. And let's move this up here. And we'll bring it down so that you can see so we can follow along here. So if G and the selected row do not equal H in the selected row plus one, so that would mean here, if G and the selected row plus H and the selected row plus one do not equal each other, then there's a problem. Or if H and the selected row plus G and the selected row plus one do not equal each other, there's also a problem. So we've done that right in here. If G in the selected row value here, this is the first check, or G plus one, right? And H do not equal each other, then do what? Then give a message box, please make sure your entries in balance, debits must equal credits, and then exit sub. All right, next up, we need to check that there's actually a count. So we want to make sure that E in the selected row is not empty or E in the selected row plus one are not empty. So that's right here. E, these two fields, both accounts are required. So we need to make sure that they both contain values, E and E in the selected row. They must both have value. We don't want the user to be, have the ability to enter transactions if they're both accounts are not valid. And the last step, we need to make sure that there is a date here. So when we look at here, date, if D in the selected row equals empty, then message lock, please enter a valid date. We gotta make sure D in the selected row contains a date. Date's very important in transactions. So we need to make sure. So we've got those three checks. All right, now that we've made sure that the user has entered all of the information into these three checks, we can then check to see if it's a new transaction or not. And remember, B4 tells us if it's a new transaction or not. B4, transaction row. Of course, if this is empty, if our transaction row, then we know it's a new transaction. We went over this formula already. We used a match formula based on the transaction number in B3. Matching B3, we went over the named range transition number. And then, of course, we're going to add four. Why are we adding four? Because our transactions actually start on row five. So if, if our first transaction number returns the one, we need to add four so that we can get row five. This would matching would return one for this. So adding four would give us the row five. We want the row number, not the match number. So our row, that's why we add four onto this. Of course, if there's an error, it's not found and we want to keep it blank. If there's an error, that would mean that no row is found. It would be a new transaction. So if if this is blank, for example, in this case, it's blank. So we're entering a new transaction. B4 is blank, and we would know that the row must be. So if it's blank, we need to find our last call, our last row of value based in column D. And then the next one would be our first available row. That is going to be our row otherwise. So either B3, either 33 is going to be our row for the transaction, or it's going to be whatever is in here before 23 in this case. So we differentiated our row. So if we go into the code here, if B4 equals empty, then we have a new transaction. Else, it's an existing transaction. So we these just this few lines of code tell us a new or existing transaction. Everything else in this macro, it won't matter whether it's new or existing because we've already differentiated. There are just two items we need to focus on between new and existing. One is the transition transaction row or trans row in this case. So if it's a new transaction, it's sheet three. Sheet three is our database, right? Our sheet three here is transactions. D99 and 
XL up row plus one. That is going to give us our first available row. First available row. In this case, it's 33. That's our first available row if it's a new transaction. And the next up is the transaction number. I need to assign a brand new transaction number to this because it's a new transaction. So how do we do that? Well, that's in B7. How do we get that? Let's take a look at B7. In our general journal, B7, we're going to use the max formula. We're going to use the max, maximum of all of the trans transaction numbers, all of them plus one. That's going to give us our first unique transaction number. That's why they're consecutive on one. If there's an error for some reason, that would mean perhaps there's no transactions at all. If we've cleared up the database, there's an error and there would be no transaction. So in that case, just set the first one to one. That's why we have one here. If there's an error, we want it to one so that our first transaction number. So if there's a max, if there's no transactions at all, if we've cleared up the database, this would be an error. There's no max, right? So that means it would revert to one as our first transaction number. So this is going to get us our next transaction number because we've added one onto the maximum of all of the transactions. So B7 is going to equal our next transaction number. And that's going to be for new transactions. So here, transaction number is B7 for new. But what about if it's an existing? Well, if in an existing, we know our transaction is in B4, the existing transition row, and B3 is our existing transaction number. Now we're ready to go. Now we're ready to enter all of the information in this over to our transactions table here. In fact, we're going to use two rows. We're going to use two rows in traditional accounting. Two rows, the debit and the credit, are in separate rows. So we're going to do just that. And then everything else we're just going to repeat. We want to know our, in fact, I should freeze this. Let's go ahead and select on the row five. I want to freeze that row. So into view and then freeze the panes. We're going to freeze it. So now when we scroll up, we can see we want our debit account in H. We want our credit account in I. All right, so back into the BBA we go. Let's take a look at what we're going to be doing. So the next up, sheet 3D. What is D? Let's take a look at here and then go into our VBA code. I'll shrink our, our code a little bit so we can see it. D, of course, is our transaction number. D is our transaction number. So sheet 3D in transition row through D, because I want to put the same transition for both both of the rows. I want to put them both here. That transaction number on both. So we want to do that here. So D plus the transaction row plus one, both of these, both of these equal the transaction number. If it's an existing, it just gets automatically replaced, but it's going to be the same value. All right. E, what's in E? That's our date. And I want to put the date in both of these and call them E. I want in course column E, our data is coming from D and the selected row. D in the selected row here, or it would be in 10, 12, all of our selected row. And of course, our selected row comes from B2. So that's where our date's going to come from. All right, next up, F, both, let's go back into transactions. F, where it's in F, F is our transaction type. So we want that in both values in F. So F and the transition row and F plus one equal D and the selected row plus one. That's our transaction right. D and the selected row plus one is our transaction type. Our, if our row is 16 plus one is 17, D is here. Our transaction type is here, 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 and here. Okay, so this is where we put in transaction type goes there in D. So we put that there. All right, next up, F is our name or vendor. I just want to put that in column F, our vendor or name here, F. So we pull that. Of course, we pull that directly from here, F, and our selected row. F is going to come from select row. So we've got that F in our selected row. That's where it's going to come from. Next up, we need to do run a check. I want to make sure that some users enter their debits or accounts first or either way. So we're going to check if G in the select row is not empty, then do something. What is that? If G in the selected row is not empty, then we know that is a debit first, debit, the user debited first. So we are going to make sure that cash on hand is our debit account. 
and we know that our credit account is interest paid in this case. So we want to make sure that we do that. Otherwise, if they've entered generally, if they've entered the credit first here and left this blank, we want to make sure the cash our hands is our credit and our debit would be interest paid based on what they've entered either here or here or here and here. So we can do that with this code here. If G in the select row does not equal empty, then our debit account is in H, right? Our debit account, we're going to put in H, is in is coming from E and going to H. Coming from E, E in the selected row, E in the selected row, and it's going to go right here into H. And our credit account is going to go into I. So we've done that here. Our credit row is in I, and it's coming from E in the selected row. That's the row below. Otherwise, if G is equal to empty, if G is empty, that would mean that the credits come first. The credits come first, which is a bit non-traditional. But then I want to make sure our credit account, our credit account, is in E in the selected row is coming from H going to H. So this is going to be our selected row plus one is our credit account coming from same account here, but it's in this case, it's H, H. So we wanna make sure that H, our debit account is here. Else, else what? H, right, plus one, H, of course, is our debit account would come from E plus one, right? The one below. So in this case, right, let's just go over that one more time. It's a little bit confusing. If the user has, let's just do that, for example, let's make a change. If the user has elected to do this and this, even though it's non-traditional, then we know our credit, credit account is cash on hand. Our debit account is interest paid. So we need to make sure that our shows that, that our debit account interest paid would go into right here, interest paid here. And our credit account would go to cash on hand. Our credit would be cash on hand here. So we want to reverse those in that case. So we need to run, make th through the code there so we can change that. And we've done the same thing with the amount. Now with the amount exactly the same, let's take a look at that here under debit amount. If G in the selected row, we're gonna take our amounts because we have to put in our debit amount and our credit amount, debit amount and credit amount. And I also wanna make sure that this, if our debit is here, I wanna make sure our credit is cleared here and I cleared here and put a balance here. So it's either gonna be this or this, this or this. So then I wanna clear those values out there. I wanna make sure that there's only two instances of a value, one in the debit, one in the credit and not, not here or here. So I wanna make sure that's an, and we do that through these lines of code here. So all we're doing here is we are taking our values and we're putting it into column J and column K and then clearing out the contents just so that there's only two values or we're doing it here and here. Basically, all I'm doing is I'm just gonna put in a value here and a value here, clearing out the other two. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Again, on transaction 11 here, we're gonna put in the debit here and the credit here. So that's how we do with those lines of code. Next up, what we do is we wanna put in the memo. Of course, that's gonna go in column M. Our memo is gonna go in column M, and it's gonna come from the transaction row plus one. It's gonna come from the transaction. Here's our memo, here's our transaction row. Here's one, so it's gonna come from F and the transition row plus one. So that's how we put that there. I want to put that there here. M equals F in the transaction row plus one. That is where it's coming from, and it's going to M in the transaction row plus one through M, both values in M. All right, next up, the range C in the select row equals the transaction number. I want to put that transaction number right here. So if it's a new transaction, I want to make sure that transaction number goes right here into C and the selected row, because that's how we do it. Okay, so C and the select row equals the transaction number. I want to hide the save button. We're just gonna do that with this line of code. We are going to take B5 and make sure B5 equals the selected row. That's very important because we want to show, remember, if it's, I want to show it in green, right? So we do that here. So if B5 equals the select row, let's say it's 22. I want it to show in green, but I only want to show it for a few seconds. So this is how we do that in the code. So B5 equals the selected row. Then we're going to wait a certain amount of time. Then we're going to clear B5. That is how we do the conditional formatting. So if I were to take this and make it to three, 
and we were going to save the transaction, you see it'd be able to clear it out just so we know. So let's say we made a change here and we want to save those changes. Let's go ahead and just click it and now we want to save those changes we're going to see green last a little bit longer now three seconds so you can change that by easily maybe i'll make it two i think uh three is a little bit too long one's a little bit too quick so too but you can change this to the number of seconds that you want that green to show up to show the user that that is and as soon as we clear the contents then no longer that green conditional formatting work and that's it so there you go that's what, the next thing i want to do is when we enter it i want to resort this list i want to take this list and i want to resort it based on the date so that we always have our newer transactions at the bottom this is a great way to sort that so Next up, I want to resort it. So we can do that with these lines of code right here. Let's bring this down a little bit. So we're going to resort the list and we're going to use with sheet. I guess we can do that. Okay, so with sheet three, we're going to resort this list. And how do we do it? The first thing we want to know is the last transaction row from sheet three, which is our transactions, D in the last row. We need to get the last row. We're going to use D. So in this case, our last row is 32. So we need to get the last row and then we're going to sort the list based all the way from the information from D through N. So we're going to do that starting with on E5. E5 is the date, right? E5 is our first date. That is what I want to sort it based on E5 right here. So that is going to be the first date and we're going to sort and the table is going to apply to all the way from d5 through n5 so we can apply that here so we're going to set the sort and the range is going to be d through m i guess yeah column doesn't row doesn't matter so d through n it's fine this this is just it's i haven't used this yet we haven't used this right yet but i'm thinking about using it in the future so i just put a spacer there so it's not there's nothing in row right now but in the future there might be all right so d through n the length this is going to sort our list based on date and that's it and then we're going to reset the calculation that just turns on screen updating and calculations that macro is right here reset calculation stop calculation this speeds up the process all right so we've gone through we know now know how to save a transaction but how do we load the transaction if you remember correctly we have a specific macro when we change this account we automatically get the transactions loaded and it's based on the date here so when we select all the transactions it's going to refresh and show all of them so how do we get that to show up? Well, I have, we have, we're gonna use an advanced filter. So we're gonna take this data, we're gonna run it through an advanced filter based on some criteria. The criteria is gonna be based on the dates, based on debit or credit account, if there are any. And of course, we are going to then get our advanced filter results. We're going to take these results and we're gonna bring them into our general journal here so if we select just a specific account let's say accounts receivable we'll show just uh, four specific transactions based on these dates so again going through our list we're going to use our criteria accounts receivable as the debit or accounts receivable as the credit bring in any results based on these dates that are provided these are actually dates they're based on numbers but we're using formulas to bring it in and that's going to be helpful so that you don't have to worry about dates based on a formatting which is really helpful and so we're going to take those results whatever results we get and we're going to bring them those results just the limited results and bring them back into our general journal we're going to do that all with the macro refresh it's the same macro that we run when we click refresh you really probably don't need that refresh button but for our purposes here and of course these row numbers they'll all be hidden and just change the font color to light blue and they'll be hidden all right, so that is how we get that. And let's continue on with our macro that refreshes the code here into the macro. Let's go up here and I'm too big and bring this up so that you can see this macro and we're going to look in the transition module transaction macros and we're going to be focused on one called load transactions load the transactions so of course i need to dimension some items like the last results row what is the last results row last result row is going to be here the last results these are all results so the last result i need to know when we bring over the information i need to know the last row so we need that that's very very important the results row is long we're going to run through all the results in a for next loop 
Also, I need to know the transaction row. That's going to keep track of our row. As we run through our transactions here, it's going to keep track of the row that we're running through. That's important because we want to skip two. And then um, we also want to have the last transaction data row because we're going to run an advanced filter. So I must know the last row of our original data here in this table. In this case, that last row is 32. So we've got to know all that information. And we're going to set the load to true, B1 value equals true. Remember, we went over that. We need, when we're loading it, we're going to be making changes to this table. But the, these changes, I don't want this green, on this type of change, I don't want this green check mark to show up on those type of changes. So to do avoid that, we set B1 to true during the macro. And then once the macro is finished or before the macro is finished, we set this back to false. All right, moving on, let's through our macro here. We, we're going to stop the calculations. This speeds up the process. We just went over that macro. We're going to clear sheet 1, C8 through H99999. And what is that? That is starting here, C8 through H, all the way, not the balances. We're going to clear this current table. I want to delete everything in that table because I don't want anything to show up. And then when we refresh it, I want it all to come back. So we want to, the first thing we want to do is clear out any of the results in our accounts, just like that. So I want to do that through the line of code, and we can do that through this line of code right here. And then with sheet three, that is our transit transaction sheet, I want to focus on that. So we're going to focus on that here, right, all the way down to here. So we're going to focus on that sheet. And of course, we're going to clear any criterion results. In fact, I believe just the criteria. I mean, just the results here. So into the transaction, if we look down here, V3, in fact, let me change that note. It's just our results, not the criteria. The criteria is controlled by formula. So we don't have to worry about that. Our criteria, here's our criteria. What do we want? This is all based on formula. So we don't need to add it in, which is really nice. It's all based on formulas. We'll go over that in just a moment. So we don't have to worry about that. All we need to do is really clear out these results. I want to clear them out so that we can get the table ready to bring in a new results, new results. So we want to clear that out. We can do that V3, of course, with sheet three, AF all the way. We're going to clear those results. I want to get the last row of the data, right? We just went over that, the last row. We need to know that. And of course, if the last row is less than five, then go to no data. That means there's no data. We don't want this macro to run if there's actually no transaction data. Next up, we're ready to run our advanced filter starting in D4. That includes our headers all the way over to N in the last transaction row. That is our main data starting in D4 right here. I want to take all this all the way to the last row, actually we used and all the way to the last row, in this case it's 32, and I want to run that advanced filter. And so we're going to run it, we're going to take these results, the results are going to be Q through T. Now how do we get these results? We've got dates, these are actually dates. Now in the past you may have seen me run advanced filters where I actually entered the date here, but now I'm going to use a formula. And a formula is really going to help us for when many, regardless of your date format, this is going to work. So we're using now a lot more often date formulas here in the criteria so that we don't have any issues with the date format so that it always works. So for example, this says if the general journal is G4 is blank, then put blank. Otherwise, greater than or equal to general journal G4. What is that? That's the from date. That is the from date. G4 is our from date. So that means we want all the transactions greater than or equal to April 1st. And our next formula is going to be based on H, we want all transactions less than or equal to April 30th, a less than or equal to April 30th. So I want to run that and also the last criteria is I want to base it on this account. I want to base it on whatever account selected. However, if the user has selected all accounts, then I want it to be empty. I want it to be empty. So we can do that in this here. So for example, it's empty here. If or the general journal is blank if the user has deleted it, right? There's no space. Then, or it's all accounts, or they've selected all accounts, then the result is blank. Otherwise, the general journal equals U4. So you see, I've selected all, our results are blank. But what if I change that to a specific account? If I change that to accounts receivable, 
now this the debit and the credit so we're gonna say or this or this okay so we want all of that all of that and we this is and and greater than that date and less than this date and within the debit account or or remember it's a line below or greater than the same date less than this date or the credit account so i want to return values with either the credit account of accounts receivable or the debit account of accounts receivable i want both of those both of those options here so we have that here so that is our criteria based on formulas that's going to get us our results so that way we can so credit in this case accounts receivable can show up here or accounts receivable can show up here either one and of course we want it based on our date range only within the date range so we can do that with these dates based on these dates and based on this display account all right, so we've got the criteria. So the criteria of our advanced filters based from Q2 through T4 of sheet three. Q, we including the headers, Q2 through T4. That's our criteria right here, Q2 through T4. And then we're going to run our results and our results are gonna be from V2 all the way through AF2. That's all we need to get our information copy to range copy to range v2 through af2 and the unique is false why did i have unique false because if the if the user is entered the same transaction twice i why not just include it i want to make sure that uh, we have a lot of duplicates here for example i want to make sure that that could happen that in case just allow duplicates in this case we're going to allow duplicates just in case you use into the same transaction, we want it to show up always. So, all right, so next up, once we've run that advanced filter, I need to know the last results row. What is the last row of our results? That's important because we're gonna bring that information over. So in this case, our last results row is 10. So then I'm gonna run a four next loop from row three all the way to row 10 and bring that data here into between 8 and 15. I'm going to bring all that data in. In fact, I want to copy. I want to bring the first debit row over, and then I want to bring the second information over here, and the balance is calculated. So we're going to worry about that. All right. So we can do that with this line of code here. So for example, the first, but before I do that, I want to sort the list based on the dates. Before I bring the information, I want to sort this. I want to take this database, because we don't know what orders, and I want to sort it from v3 all the way over to a f in the last row sort it based on w3 which is our first date first date based on that is the key w3 i want to base it so that the earliest date appears in the latest date so they're always in date order our results so we can do that sorting the fields on w3 as i just mentioned and we're going to sort those ascending we want those ascending so that uh, the newest uh, appears last and the earliest appears first then of course our sort range is going to be v3 through af in the last results row that sorts our data based on dates before we bring it back into the general journal all right we don't need that line of code now the transaction row it's going to set that at eight that's going to be our first row of transactions because we're going to track that row we're going to skip every two but i want to make sure that we transact our first set our first row to be row eight which is going to be here all right, so when that that's and then it's going to go from 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 until we're done so we need to set it first so the results row we're going to set the results row this is going to be the beginning of our loop we're going to say from three to the last results row step two why are we doing that so into our transaction let's take a look at our results row we have two rows for every single transaction so we want to skip two we're going to go starting at three all the last skipping two so it's going to go from three to five to seven nine and then eleven okay eleven just to nine eleven it'll be done so ten well in this case it's ten transaction number eleven so we're going to skip those two and for each of those we're going to do something so what are we going to do every two rows so for every two rows we're going to say sheet one c in the transaction row and h in the transaction row equals v and the results row through a what is that v through a well let's take a look at that v v through a a is our first row if you take a look at that the way that i've set these up 
one, the for this is all of the first line of code. So we're gonna say this line of code here, starting in C, C1, all the way through H here equals this right here, right here. So that's the first line. What about the second line? The second line is actually here. Invoice AB through AF, AB through AF. We're gonna bring that, I'm gonna bring that right here. D and the, and the transaction row plus one is equal to all the way here. So I'm bringing that information right here, starting with invoice and all the way to 150. So if you see that, starting with invoice and all the way to 150, in fact, it's gonna be all the way to the credit, a, B through A, F. So how do we do it? Just two lines of code, right? So the first, the first row, C in the transaction row, equals V in the results row here. The second one is sheet one, D plus one, the second row down from the transaction row, all the way through H, and the second row down equals A, B through A, F. A, B. So A, B in the second row. So we've got A, B here. So our second row is going to be here, right here. Our first row here, second row here. Again, first row here, second row here. So we're bringing this information and I'm gonna bring in it here. First row here, second row, excuse me, first row starts in C because it includes a transaction number here. Second row starts in D and goes over to here. So second row, same thing. So we just keep doing that through our loop. First row here, second row here. So we go through that and we do that loop all the way down. And each time, of course, we're increasing the transaction row that's starting at eight and then it goes, it adds to, then it goes to 10, then to 12, then to 14. So again, starting it, so we make sure we wanna add row here. We wanna add one row here. So that's very important. And we can remove this line. So we're gonna add add two each time to the J and then we so this is our loop right here let's tab that back over this is our loop right here that's all we want to do so that's how we get the data and the next thing we're going to set the load to false we're setting the load to false all right because we've done that and then we're going to reset the calculation that is all we need to do with this and that's going to load all of the transactions in there we've already gone over the show show save button so that's we've covered that and so we've also gone over the save transactions. Now we've got some formulas, and we've got a few more to show you, but we're gonna save that for you the next part. We've gone way over time on this. And of course, make sure you get your version here. I'll include the links down below, so make sure you get it there. And of course, if you have not already, make sure you uh, enroll in our amazing dashboard masterclass. That's gonna take all this data and create amazing single-click reports, as well as our resource guide, if you want a 1,000 resources, uh, including 100 PDF downloads, 100 free Excel courses, and uh, of course, 100 websites and blogs, 100 utilities, uh, tons of listings. It's an amazing application. Uh, it's fully updatable. I'll include the links for that down below. Again, that helps uh, keep these videos free each week, so I really appreciate your support. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week for part two. We're going to do split transactions. We're going to go over some of the formulas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.